Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Alexis Bateman and I'm a research scientist here at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics and I also direct our Sustainable Supply Chains Initiative. Today we're super fortunate to have MIT professor Yossi Sheffi with us, a highly regarded expert in all things supply chain, but especially in risk and resilience. And he's written several books on the topic, including The Resilient Enterprise and The Power of Resilience via MIT Press. And through this whole ordeal of coronavirus, he's been in close contact with our MIT CTL partners regarding their reactions to the spread of coronavirus. Yossi, thanks for making the time for us today. Thank you for doing this, it's a good idea. All right. So for about the next 30 minutes, we're going to explore with EOC the supply chain impacts caused by COVID-19 coronavirus. And at the end of this discussion, we will have a really short amount of time for questions. So if you guys are thinking about some questions, please save them and post them in, in the Q&A forum and we'll try to get it to as many as we can. Uh, please use the webinar Q&A feature to ask those questions. Be sure to be logged in with a name. We're not going to be reading any questions from anonymous users. And also throughout this discussion, we're going to be running some polls. So please take a minute to fill them out so you'll be able to see real time results about how other supply chain professionals are being impacted by coronavirus. And we'll be able to learn more about everyone on the webinar today. So watch out for those as we go along. All right, so let's dive right in. So on February 18th, you wrote in the Wall Street Journal that previous disruptive events like SARS or Fukushima were not a really good yard sit for this epidemic. Uh, Professor Chevy, can you tell us a little about, about this disruption and what makes it so different from others? Well, uh, sure. The coronavirus disruption is different in several aspects. First of all, unlike say Fukushima or the Thailand floods or uh, you know, several hurricanes, it affects both supply and demand. It's not only that supply in China is being affected, it affects demand in China, of course, and worldwide. Right now we see demand in China is being affected. Uh, several uh, retail stores are closing. Lots of activities are, uh, are being curtailed. So we see the whole economic activity in China going down. Now we see it in South Korea. We see it in, uh, um, in Northern Italy, other European countries. We start seeing it in the United States. So we have the problem with the supply that started in uh, uh, Wuhan in China, factory closing, workers cannot come back from the uh, New Year um, migration when they all uh, go home, go back to the factories. So we had still are feeling the impacts and we will start feeling it in two, three, four weeks the impact will crest in the United States and Europe, and I can explain why, uh, why is this timing uh, like that. But uh, so we have the fear of the virus, which impacts demand. And this will be, at the end of the day, my feeling is this will be bigger than even the supply uh, event. And, and to this, the fact that we don't know many things about the virus still. Not only there's no, um, nothing to fight it, nothing even to help people who are sick. There's no clear how to treat, it's not clear how to treat them. So there's a fear going on that impacts economic activity. Right, oh, super interesting. Uh, thanks, so in late January, you actually, right after this broke out, you surveyed some of our MIT CTL partners and constituents regarding some of the actions they were taking, if any, and in reaction to the spread of the virus. And at the time, the total reported infections were only 8,000 and mostly in China. And before we get into the question, I want to launch a poll if you guys are able to fill that out and then we'll be looking at those results in real time. And so while we wait for people to fill out their, what they feel, how they feel impacted, can you tell us anything about what you served you know, now almost a month ago about that initial survey when the pandemic was still fairly contained and what, how it's transitioned to now. Yeah, a month ago, I got a lot of pushback when I said that uh, this, should, this uh, disruption should not be compared to SARS or uh, Fukushima or Thailand. It should best be compared to two uh, point of reference that I could see. The first one was the 1918 so-called Spanish influenza that was enormous. It had actually very low mortality rate, but 
hundreds of millions of, of, of people were affected and there are between 50 and 70 million people died worldwide. That's one frame of reference. Now we have better healthcare, we better understand how to, how to deal with pandemic, but one has to keep an eye on this. The other one is the 2008 um, economic downturn because one can still expect a significant economic downturn as a result of the virus. We saw the plunge in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and other uh, stock average across the world. It's actually down today after going up yesterday because of, in part because of the US election. But uh, it, it, as we speak, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is significantly down and I expect it to continue going down in the, uh, in the coming days. We can talk about the timing now or later. Sure, yeah, why don't we talk about the timing a little bit now? So if you remember about the, the uh, epidemic was starting to get the first um, factory closures outside of China was in Japan and South Korea. Japan, Nissan was closing factories in Japan and Hyundai was closing factories in uh, South Korea. Now those factories are between a week and two weeks away from the centers of manufacturing in China. We are six to eight weeks away as the ship goes between a manufacturing center in China and the United States. Add to it some of the slowness of the transportation system in China right now are subject to a lot of uh, audit and checks and uh, uh, not you know, movement that is uh, impeded in many ways. And if you do the calculation, you expect between mid-March, beginning of April, US factories, European factories to start having shortages of parts. Of course, it's not as uh, disconcerning if we will build less cars, uh, aside from the fact that it will have employment ramification. What is most disconcerned is that we will have, we will may not enough, may not have enough pharmaceuticals. A lot of uh, pharmaceutical components, not always the finished product, are made in China, and this will impact both Europe and the United States. And this is something that uh, people are now starting to realize how dependent the West is on uh, intermediate material made in China. All of this will start creating even more fear, more panic, uh, and we will see, I expect the market to keep going down and expect to see a lot of unpleasant ramifications in the coming weeks and months. Well, some sobering information there. <laughs> <laughs> so actually on Bloomberg, you were interviewed and you at the end of February and you advised some companies should be taking more action. Can you talk about a yeah. few of those actions that you suggest for, for companies being impacted? Well, it's nice to talk to people in the supply chain field because you guys understand the bullwhip effect. And I was talking on the, about the bullwhip effect because what happened, just remind it to, uh, to our audience, you know, let's say a retailer looks at the forecast and sees reduction actual, you know, customer demand by X percent, let's say 10 percent. Uh, X percent reduction. Now, they look to the future and said customers are uh, reducing demand by 10 percent, by X percent. So we should reduce order by X percent. But we, on top of it, we also have inventory that we ordered based on previous forecasts. So we have too much inventory. Because of these two factors, we're going to decrease the order to our wholesaler, not by X percent, by 2X percent, not by 10 percent, but maybe 20 percent. The wholesaler has exactly the same thing. He sees 2x reduction in its order. It has, it thinks it will continue. It has too much inventory. So it looks to it to the manufacturer and uh, cuts its order by 3x or 4x. And it goes up, upstream in, in the supply chain. The people who are most vulnerable, the company who are most vulnerable are the company at this upstream in the supply chain. In many cases, these are small suppliers who did not have the wherewithal to withstand such reduction in order. We just saw today the first European airline, obviously a small airline in Britain, Flybe, just went out of business. This is the first thing. So just think about what's happening in the airline industry. Flights are down significantly. Airlines are flying 
empty or not flying at all, which means all the people who serve them, the people who prepare the meals, the people who, pre who, who move the gasoline around, all of these people are now being um, having less work. They're the people who supply to them, the people who make the, the, the cardboard for the, for the meals on, on flight, three levels up in the supply chain are now having significant less uh, um, orders. It comes, down, it comes up to small suppliers at the end. And by the way, let's talk a little bit about what governments and companies can do. Companies who went through the 2008 downturn realized their dependency on suppliers. And in 2008, many companies extended their own credit to their suppliers, even invested in suppliers in order to make sure that they'll be viable because without the parts and the material coming up throughout the supply chain, they cannot assemble and build their own product. So a lot of manufacturers from Intel to Toyota to uh, uh, Procter & Gamble were aware of this. Governments are also aware of this. The Chinese government just announced, well, just a week ago, announced that the, the state bank have to lend to small businesses and they reduce the taxes on small businesses. The government of Germany and Holland changed the labor law. Now you can go on part-time and still collect unemployment. So people can go on 50% and for the 50% that they don't work, the government will pay 70% of that. So governments are getting ready for a downturn. This is much better than 2008 when government were caught unprepared. Government now know what to do about this and start helping the vulnerable part of the, uh, of the economy. Right, thank you, Yes, that's really insightful. Uh, before we get to the next question, let's uh, look at the poll results that everyone filled out. And so the question was, how is your company or organization reacting to the coronavirus? So the biggest impact was grounding all non-essential travel. So over 50% of you said that was uh, one of the primary actions. Other high data points were setting up an emergency management center at 38%. 33% of you said creating a customer product priority plan, 29% setting up a clear line of communication to government and regulatory agencies, and the next highest one would be uh, consulting with local contacts in areas of outbreaks, and so all relevant impacts. Makes sense. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. All right, so let's go to the next. So, so based on these results and what you've been hearing from your contacts, what type of companies are most vulnerable to the crisis? Well, we just talked about it. Obviously, look, uh, we can go over some industries. Certainly the uh, um, airline industry is being hit hard. The whole, um, anything related to tourism is being hit very hard. Uh, hotels, anything related to conferences all gathering. Um, I'm watching one of the countries that has probably the best uh, uh, healthcare system and the best uh, IT is, is Israel. And they just, they just had a, a big um, soccer game that was played in front of an empty stadium. Uh, there are pictures of this in, in the Israeli uh, uh, newspaper. But uh, so the entire, you know, anything related to tourism is going to is going to be hit hard. Uh, manufacturers with a, that depend on China are, as I said, will be hit in two, three, four weeks. We'll see start shortages of, of parts coming in. Already, by the way, if you order computer from your favorite uh, suppliers, uh, the Dell or HP or, or somebody else you'll find out that you don't get everything right away. A lot of stuff as they give you, it will be available in a month or two, or sometimes they don't even know when it will be, uh, it will be available. So we look, uh, we look at manufacturing. Insurance industry, insurance, uh, depending on how this is developed, because usually it's very, insurance industry doesn't pay for uh, when demand goes down considered business as usual. It's, and furthermore, the insurance industry may decide that this is a so-called force majeure, mm. that they don't have to pay if it's something outside the normal, uh, uh, normal business. 
So I, I don't see I don't see the insurance industry paying. Finance industry, banking, and so forth are going to be hit because uh, uh, first of all, we see immediately that the interest are going down, which usually hit hit the banks, but uh, reduce economic activity. Just like 2008, the banks were hit very badly. So the, ba the banks are going to be uh, are going to be hit. I don't see anything related to defense spending being hit. There's, I, I don't see any, any impact on, uh, on on defense contractors. Um, it's kind of trying to think about industries mm -hmm. industries that come to mind, but what will uh, and will not be hit. At MIT, by the way, we are starting to starting we're already making plans for what happens if we have to start uh, having students at home and having teaching from home and having move a lot of our activities to online. We already canceled several conferences and several trips. So we are acting in the same way that most companies are acting. Uh, Non-essential travel is being, you know, cartel. Uh, student travel in particular is being curtailed. Um, we're making plans to continue business by continue our research activity and teaching activity online and from home. We're doing what everybody else is doing. This is where our experience in the MicroMasters online digital learning is coming into action. Absolutely. As it turns out, the Center for Transportation Logistics, we led MIT in MicroMaster and online learning, is very well positioned for this. And in fact, a lot of our um, experience now is shared with the rest of MIT in order to help the, the institution do it wherever it can. Right, absolutely. Uh, so we talked uh, in a little bit before about how, you know, some government responses. I was wondering what your perspective was on, you know, some as governments have made uh, policies and plans and announcements re regarding the coronavirus and any lack of transparency in those choices does has that created any okay. issues <laughs> i'm trying not to be political here <laughs> but uh, in every event in every crisis the number one thing the most important thing is to have straightforward continuous information flow and believable information let's talk about china rather than the united states they kiss me out of trouble um so one of the problems in China is that because they were hiding the initial outbreak, because the governors and the people in charge at Wuhan were basically punishing the doctors who were telling them that something is going on, Chinese population is losing faith in the government. Because the, when the government does not give straightforward information, you don't know what to do. Uh, we now see in the United States, how shall I say, a difference between what the White House is saying and what the Center for Disease Control is saying. And I would urge people to listen to the Centers of Disease Control uh, rather than the White House, because it's um, in many countries, particularly in the, in the United States, the, uh, the response is being politicized. And it's really unfortunate, because at this point, it's all hands on deck, and we all should be in it together. Uh, you know, the the uh, the virus was not distinguished between Democrats and Republicans, so <laughs> everybody is in the same boat. And I hope people will think about it. And uh, whether Democrat attacking the uh, um, the president for not doing the right thing, or the president does not agree with the center for you know the, the experts on this. I, it has to stop, you know, to help uh, to help the country. And the United, in this point, it's amazing that the United States and China are kind of in the same boat in terms of how people trust or not trust the government. Yeah, no, very insightful. And coronavirus, at the unfortunately, is a great equalizer for all. Great, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <clears throat> so let me just launch a, another poll about how you guys are being impacted, get some feedback on that. So, you know, we have many active supply chain professionals on the line right now. So do you have some advice for these, for these professionals who are struggling through this impact right now? What are best practices for them in place that they can use to manage this impact in this time of uncertainty? The good thing about the supply chain in general is we have been conducting business online for 
decades now. It's, um, you know, globalization made sure that communication lines exist. And we can communicate with people, with uh, both customers and suppliers all over the world. We should, however, think about, uh, I don't know if you have Paul later about it, but uh, what should su supply chain managers be doing? So supply chain managers should be, most importantly, trying to think about suppliers, which suppliers are critical and which are vulnerable. Mm -hmm try to get as deep in the supply chain as they can, communicate with tier, tier one supplier who should communicate with tier two, tier three, what, what's happening there. Should start um, thinking about if they don't have enough parts, and you know, in many cases, parts are going to many products, which product should be built and which should not? Which customers should be served and which should not? Which customers should be, should be served at, half, at, at what percentage? How to calculate it? Because customers will start, for example, if you decide that customers are getting, you know, only half of what they ask for, to make things simple, everybody will order double because they understand your algorithm. So you, what you have to look at right now is look at their past orders and forecast what the order should be like uh, and base your decision on that. Uh, so a lot of this preparation should be done now before something before you get into trouble because making decisions when the crisis is you know in its peak usually does not make for good decision yeah there are lots of other things we should think about the decision making um who makes the decision under what circumstances let's say your ceo your cfo your head of supply chain Ford C has to stay home. Decision has to be made. Who makes them? Who has the, the authority to make what decisions? All of these things should be explained and communicated now before we get into a situation that uh, like Alexander Haig, uh, this is a very US centric uh, uh, reference when President Reagan was shot, Alexander Haig came online, uh, came on TV and said, I'm in charge. Turns out, according to the Constitution, he was not. But <laughs> he tried. It's, it's an example of what happens when you start to make decisions in a crisis situation when people are not, not they're not the best at thinking straight. Sure, sure. Well, that's good, good and timely advice for, for everyone on the line. Uh, so, given what we know today, plus your past work and, and ongoing work in resilience, has this pandemic come to a peak? And how long do you think supply chains are going to be disrupted? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad Just that, an easy I'm question. Glad there is an easy question, <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, it's hard to forecast, of course. Uh, forecasts, uh, we know the first rule of forecasting is forecasts are always wrong. So this is going to be wrong as well, but what the hell? I'll do it. So as I said, I expect Europe and the United States to peak in terms, of, not to peak, to start realizing in earnest a um, lack of parts and material coming from China, uh, coming from China, coming from South Korea. Uh, we already seen a uh, significant demand reduction. Uh, this just based on fear. People don't feel like buying cars when there's, uh, you know, uh, Amazon announce now because people are there's a surge of online buying that uh, people are not going to get all the stuff in two hours or the next day whatever their uh, promise is because the numbers are so large that uh, they can't really do it um, there's a surge in in order at the same time amazon will start having shortages starving products that are not there right now try to get a bottle of water on amazon Actually, you can't. As of yesterday, I tried. You, you couldn't get a bottle of water. They're out of water. Uh, people are starting to keep stashes at home of uh, food and water. So, some food like uh, cereals now they can last a long time. People are buying uh, in lar in large quantities. So, but anyway, the question was, when do I expect shortages to start? 
getting to a high level. I don't say to peak because peak means that they'll go down immediately afterwards. I don't expect this to happen. What happened is right now, Chinese factories will go to, for example, Foxconn announces by the end of March, they'll be up to 70 or 80% of capacity. It's still not 100%, uh, but they think that by the end of April, they'll go to 100%. That uh, could be right, could be wishful thinking. We just had last night, we had suddenly an unexplained jump of um, cases in Wuhan, which we thought was going down already, mm. significantly going down in Wuhan and across China, which just had an unexplained jump. So that's partly what spooked the market uh, this morning. Um, so as I said, one of the problems here, we know so little about this particular pathogen, this particular virus, and we cannot yet assume the behavior. But we know that vessels from, uh, from China, there will be a marked reduction in the number of uh, sailings. The number of sailing coming to the United States starting mid-March, end of March, that's when we start getting hits. Right, right. Yeah seems like it's it's there's still more to come so and there's and still more to come absolutely the poll seems to agree with that as well in terms of what does the poll say that so a question to pose was is dealing with coronavirus impacting your daily duty significantly so a quarter of you said yes significantly 33 percent said yes a little only 11 percent said no so it is kind of impacting everyone almost equally and then 31 percent said no but i think it will soon so there's some being impacted now but the remaining will likely be impacted in the near future. All right, all right, so let's go on to the future question. So we'll, I'll ask uh, one more of my own question and then we will open it up for a few audience questions. We're only gonna have a little bit of time, but if you want to ask a question, make sure to get your question in there now. So with this disruption ongoing and with the imperative to prepare for future disruptions, what can companies do now to better adapt for the future? Uh, it's too late now, by and large. It's uh, now that we the disruption is in full force. It's uh, or getting ready to be in, in full force. There's no time to move manufacturing out of China. It's uh, and by the way, there's a question: Where would you move it? Uh, you move it to the next place that's going to be hit. Uh, you move it to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to uh, um, South South Korea. It's uh, it's not clear where to move it. It is, what is clear is that one may want to do, to have multiple, multiple suppliers in different parts of the, uh, uh, of the world. So at least it doesn't hit at the same time. And there's, you know, maybe by the time that it hit uh, Mexico and Latin America, and it will, um, China is getting back online. So you have some type of, uh, um, equilibrium there. Um, so that's the best that I, I think that you can do in terms of, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the long run. Uh, moving manufacturing out of China, yeah, in general, you want, it's not moving manufacturing out of China. It's having, you know, manufacturing elsewhere. The problem with moving manufacturing out of China is that we've become too dependent on China. China started, you know, for products like uh, garments that are basically based on uh, low labor costs, yeah, you can move them to Vietnam, you can move it elsewhere. But for high tech products, automotive parts, Chinese are simply too good. Uh, they are innovative, they're good. It's not easy to find the same level of, uh, of uh, supplier capability elsewhere. As an example, who would have even thought that anybody can build a hospital in 10 days. I mean, it just shows the level of, uh, you know, capability in China that actually doesn't exist anywhere in the world. So it's not clear that one can move out of China. It's a long term and I would say balancing is more realistic than moving out of China. Um, and uh, there are certain things that one should do like a better visibility into deeper tier supplier. Sure, uh, always something the, um, the 
that's important. And investing in, uh, this is becoming easier to do with uh, IoT and lots of new products that are coming online that allow companies to have better visibility and understand also the importance of better visibility. And the importance of better visibility in, the, in a crisis is simply having an earlier warning. So companies should map their supply chain, should understand where not only where the headquarters, you know, when you run your SAP system and you look at the supplier address, it will give you the headquarters address because that's where you send the check. That's not the issue for supply chain professionals. You need to know where the plants are of the supplier. So if something comes up in some city or area uh, around the world, you know what is being affected. You should know what is made there, what products are made there that impact your product and your customers. So mapping the supply chain at that level is also something that takes time. The good thing is there are now several um, commercial suppliers of this kind of mapping capabilities that can help you do it. Still something that takes time, takes work, but it's imperative to make sure that you can deal better with the next disruption. Right, absolutely. Good advice to think about for now and continuing in the future. So I just released one more poll about how you see um, your companies adapting. So if you could take a minute to fill out that poll. And now we're gonna dive into a few questions. We crowdsourced some that came in early and then I'll start pulling from the list for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll need to sign off. But one of the quick questions here will be, Given the macro and trying to stay as apolitical as possible, but obviously this is a politically loaded question. Given the macro environment of coronavirus, nationalistic policies, how do you see anti-globalization evolving or developing in the near term and future? Yeah, this is a, this is a problematic, of course. It's interesting that in the US, the two extreme parties, both Trump on the other side and Bernie Sanders, for those who follow US uh, uh, politics, Bernie Sanders on the far left, while um, many of Trump supporters on the far right, the only thing they agree on is they're both anti-globalization. They both want to pull the US out of any engagement in the world, which is nuts. I mean, that's a technical term. I mean, it's a, it's, it will lead to reduction in the standard of living in the US and throughout. Um, it just cannot, it, it's, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, in fact, the coronavirus, I made a statement before about the uh, coronavirus doesn't distinguish between Democrat and Republican. It also doesn't distinguish between Chinese and American. It doesn't distinguish between Vietnamese and Russian. It's a worldwide phenomena. And the world has to act together on this. And in this sense, let me just give China it, its dues. They identified the, uh, the structure, the DNA structure of, of the virus early and distributed it around the world. This is in fact what the world is using now. There are actually three tests, there are DNA, RNA, and, uh, and protein tests that are used to, uh, to validate that somebody has, has the virus. Well, the signature of the virus came from China. They very quickly identified and uh, informed the world around it. So it's, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon that needs, I, I'm not saying Chinese did everything that they didn't allow the World Health Organization in right away and other things, but they did many things right. Um, the US government does many things right and quite a few things wrong. It's uh, so you try to get something that when government, my guess is many governments in uh, Europe are better positioned for this because there's more uh, trust in government in general than in the US in general. So places where there's trust in government in this particular crisis is, uh, are better equipped to fight, to fight the virus. So let's uh, take a quick look, po look at our poll that we just ran, which is how do you think, do you think the disru disruption is gonna change how your company operates in the supply chain in the future? And so by and large, uh, everyone said, having a greater risk management protocols in place, 63% out of a multi-select question, 
more visibility to deeper tier suppliers, as, as EOC just mentioned. Another one would be more remote work opportunities. So in case kind of trialing those in terms of when there's that's an opportunity or where, whether that's a possibility. And then the next highest will be overall travel reduction, maybe an impact or future scenario out of this. So some interesting results there. So I wanted to pull a question I think is really interesting from Ram Ding. He asks, will this crisis be an opportunity for some industries such as online retailing? You mentioned that a little bit, not exposed to human interaction or automatic, you know, more automation and manufacturing like robots replacing labor? The answer is yes. Again, I'm, uh, I'm looking at what Israel is doing. The way they isolate people is the following. The caretakers are not getting into the same room with the patient. The patients are totally instrumented. They are in bed. They are, um, they are sending every few seconds the vital signs through, uh, through a computer. People who just uh, suspect that they have it get an instrument they can put under the mattress that tests their uh, breathing because this virus affects you know the lungs so it, uh, it, it, it sends messages if during night even you don't know it at night your breathing is not normal so it sends again an alert and this is every people can just get it because they are you know, they suspect that they, uh, that they have the virus. So, you know, go back to the question. What, oh, it what says, is it? Uh, the industries that will be... Ah, okay, so, so you have, uh, so I see in Israel, several robotics companies are doing very well. I see uh, a lot of companies who uh, manufacture sensors doing very well. In terms of uh, processes, after working at home, a lot of people may like it. Not everybody, but it will allow people to work remotely. Uh, we at CTL have several of our, of our professional working remotely. In fact, Alexis works out of California. Uh, we, we have several other people who work remotely because uh, in this day and age, you really don't have to, to be face to face. Maybe there has to be a period when you have to be face to face, but after you know your uh, colleagues and, and the project, more and more people will start working remotely. Uh, we will have better software as Zoom is doing very well now. Uh, and <laughs> companies who provide uh, the capabilities to work this way are doing very well. So we'll have uh, more of that. Other than that, I try to think about uh, there'll be another push or even greater push for IoT, for uh, Internet of Things, those sensors, and to create long-term visibility. Mapping of supply chains, understanding where your stuff is coming from. Companies are going to be even better prepared to the uh, uh, for the next one. Um, trying to think that's about it. So for some, at least, the outlook is slightly positive. So we can take some, sure some glimmers the, of hope. <laughs> sure, the outlook is, is, is slightly positive. It's, uh, you know. So another question uh, that Etisham is asking is, why are supply chains reacting so late to this? Ah, great question. Because when everything's said and done, there's a lot more said than done. People have been talking of what, what happens with crisis is really, in some sense, unfortunate. When the crisis happens, people get all excited and commit to doing this, that, and the other thing. And then the crisis is over. And in most companies, the, there's no redundancy in staff. So people have to do to work a lot. And people are always under pressure to solve the day-to-day -day issue, the day-to-day -day problem. And long-term issues are forgotten, simply left by the wayside, because suddenly you have to answer to this customer, you have this problem in production, you have this type of, uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, shipment stuck in some, in some port. So that's, that's where you go right back to. And in fact, when I'm talking to boards, 
I always tell them it's their responsibility, the board of directors, because even the CEO has to deal with the day-to-day -day, uh, in many cases, but board of directors have to make sure that the, the, the strategic planning going on almost continuously and looking at what is this, that, uh, what are the long-term issues and what are the even uh, plans, what are the HR uh, bonus plans, remuneration plans that take into account long-term thinking. It's a lot have been written about the fact that public companies are living quarter to quarter, they're managing quarter to quarter, and this is the enemy of long-term thinking, of trying to solve the next coronavirus, Fukushima, SARS, whatever it is, Syrian refugees, there are problems all over the world. And some of them we can predict, some of them we don't, but there are general rules of having emergency operations center, having communication, having visibility, having uh, decision-making uh, uh, authority, prioritize customer, understand who su our suppliers are. All of these issues work in every disruption. So all of this should be there and uh, ready to, uh, to unveil. I mean, many companies like uh, uh, Cisco, I think, has what they call playbooks, have 18 playbooks or for several types of disruptions, they have a playbook on, on what to do in, uh, in this case. More and more companies should have playbooks. And the issue is most large companies by now have them. Um, they can be better, of course, but most large companies have them. The problem is the small companies which are part of the ecosystem of these large companies, the small suppliers who usually don't have the, uh, the capacity to develop these plans. Right. Very insightful. So one reference, a few questions I saw asking about uh, Yossi's research that he did with our CTL partners. So after you log out of this, we'll actually have a, a links to all of the things he's already written and some of his interviews he's done with Bloom, Bloomberg and CNBC. So be sure to watch those because he, he discusses some of those results there as well. And so I think that we have time for one more question. So I saw it scattered a couple times throughout this and now I can't find it, but <laughs> customer uh, prioritization. So when there's not enough yes. product, how do you deal with the customers while maintaining that relationship? Okay, the simple, uh, by the way, many questions have simple answers and it's usually wrong. And the simple answer is you do it by margin. You know, customer margins are dry. That's usually wrong and most people know that it's wrong. Uh, because for example, if you just got your first uh, order from Walmart, you really, even though it's a small part right now, Walmart can make you huge. So you don't want to uh, not, not serve Walmart. Um, so you have, you have to think about customer vulnerability. In many, we even found cases when companies served small customers rather than big customers because they thought that the small customer depend on them and may go out of business if they don't serve them. While big customers have, you know, a broader range of products and may survive if they get only 50% of the amount that they, uh, that they order. All of this consideration, consideration of equity. Um, you don't want to be seen as favoring one customer over another because the customer who's, un who's not favored is gonna get back at you later on when they can. Some companies did, the, when there were shortages, for example, after the Thailand floods, some companies did auctions. Every economist will tell you that auctions are actually the best mechanism because you allocate the parts to the person who needs it most. However, auction gets the prices way up when there's a shortage and companies look at it as you are actually using the, uh, your profit, you know, profiteering. You're raising your profit in, in time when we are all in trouble. So, you ruin customer relationships. You have to think about all of these things. How do you decide which customer to serve and which customers not to serve? Right, no, very important to think about all those variations. So we have tons of questions we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be able to get to today, but we are gonna be opening a chat. So some of our team from the MicroMasters and others around the center will be trying to tackle some of your questions. So one final question before we sign off today, how has this impact highlighted the role of the supply chain professional? Yeah, it's a, 
It reminds me of a colleague of mine in civil engineering department whose research is on earthquakes. And every time there's an earthquake, he's in the news and he's, you know. So right now there's an earthquake. There's a, we look at the shortages and people are looking at the procurement professionals, manufacturing professionals, distribution professionals. What do we do in case? What do we do already? We, we can't get our stuff out of China, find us uh, you know, alternate suppliers. Well, if you before, if you had before some alternate suppliers ready and you tested them and you know the quality, you're in better shape than just trying out to find who can make a certain part. When by the way, all your competitors are in the same boat. They are all jumping on the, on the one supplier who can be an alternative and they cannot supply, uh, supply everything. So, he who is, you know, the, the better prepared is better prepared. And if you're doing this at the, at the last minute, it uh, doesn't work usually. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Yossi, for your time. This has been really sure. insightful. I hope this has been helpful for all of you bringing Yossi's wisdom today. And like I said, keep in touch. We'll be answering questions as we go. Be sure to reference all the materials Yossi's putting out there right now to be able to support everyone. And best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you all.